Thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, it's great to see all these folks. Um, so my name is Dan Lowe. I'm an anesthesiologist um, by training. You might tell from my accent I'm not from around here. Um, from the U trained in the UK, moved here 10 years ago. And um, one of the things we noticed when we came here is the, uh, you know, the amount of opioids we use in anesthesia and perioperative space uh, is uh, very different from the rest of the world. And then, you know, uh, so here I'm going to talk about how we've used technology to actually eliminate opioids from surgery. That was actually thought to be unthinkable uh, even a year ago, but we've, uh, and I'll tell that story. So I do have a conflict of interest. Uh, my, uh, I, wear, I do wear another hat. I founded MD Metrics a few years ago to, to solve this problem. Uh, it's a software company that is, enables clinicians to mine data out of the EMR so you can learn from it. So I am an equity holder. I'm a chief medical officer. So uh, that's my, my disclosure. So just um, take a second. Um, the opiate crisis in America has claims about 130 lives a day. Um, can you put up your hand if you know someone in your family or your colleague, a friend, anyone in your immediate circle of acquaintances who's been afflicted by opioid addiction? Wow. So that's more than half the room. Thank you. All right. Um, so it's a sad fact uh, that the, the statistics up. Um, the America has 5% uh, of the world's population, yet consumes 80% of the manufactured opioids in the world. Um, and so why am I speaking about this as an anesthesiologist? Well, actually, uh, we're partly responsible. So surgery is actually a gateway to persistent opioid use. If any of you have surgery today in the US, you have a 6.5% chance of still using opioids in 90 days. And that's regardless of what surgery, OK? So if you have a, a two-inch incisional hernia surgery, in nine, three months from now, like in the summer, when your kids get out of school, you'll still be taking oxycodone. That's, that's messed up. A C-section, varicose vein excision, lap coli, any of those surgeries. For teenagers, we know it's a 5%. And across all surgeries, let me give you a story about this. I gave this talk recently, and one of the nurses came up to me afterwards um, and said, and she gave me permission to share this story. And she says, can I tell, can I tell you about my daughter? Let me tell you about Brie. Brie was 17 years old. She was an honors grade high school student. Um, she had a full ride scholarship to a culinary college. In her final year of high school, she went for an outpatient tonsillectomy. She got given 24 doses of oxycodone. She took them all. She asked her mum for a refill at the end of week one. And mum was like, oh, OK, well, that's a little unusual, but did it. Within a f it turns out, in retrospect now, three, three or four weeks later, she started uh, diverting grandma's Oxycontin, who was on Oxycontin for cancer pain. And she's been fighting opioid addiction ever since. That was 10 years ago. So that's a face for this story. She, she gave me permission to share that. So let me give you a face for that 5%. That's what it looks like. Well, um, we can. We can turn the tide. So in terms of the numbers, 50 million surgeries are done in the US a year. If uh, the 5% number is anywhere near true, that means 5,000 people are hitting that 90-day mark a day. There's 2, million, 2 million of those patients become persistent opioid users, if that's true. Uh, so let's, uh, let's deal with source control. Let's, let's tackle it at the bottom. So using technology, uh, this is the result. I'm just going to lead with my, um, the punchline. This is a surgery center that used, uh, uh, le were able to leverage real world data. And this is three commonly used um, uh, opioids, morphine, fentanyl, and alfentanyl. And over, and this surgery center treats about 6,000 patients a year. Over the last 18 months, has driven the opioid use to zero. And I'll show you the patient outcomes associated with that. Okay. Now, the remarkable thing, they did it not with new drugs. The drugs they use, uh, multimodals and regional anesthesia, it's been around for 5, 10, 15 years. It's the application of those drugs and those techniques which they were able to learn from to reduce their reliance on opioids. So, you, uh, so that turned essentially 60 years of anesthesia practice on its head. So how, how was this possible? So I'm going to give you a brief run through. So yes. Um, we, we had uh, Paul talk about lean and, you know, PDSA cycles, so we all do that. And we all know uh, you plan something, you do something, you study it, and you act, right? Who, who, like the clinicians here and the, host, the people who work in healthcare, are you familiar with this concept? You guys do this? Yeah. How, 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 how quickly can that circle spin? Uh, does it spin in a week, a month, a year, two years? Give me a number. 
depends. If you're going to change something in your practice, like how, how you care for something common in your practice, is that an easy thing to do? No. no. Right, why not? It sound, yeah, it sounds so simple, right? So um, w what's the first step of planning? So let's say we want to improve the outcomes for, I don't know, tonsillectomy patients. What's the first step in planning? Committee. A committee, OK. Get, <laughs> get some data to show what's my baseline performance. If I don't know my baseline performance, how do I know if it's better or worse six months later, right? So how, quick, how easy is it to get that data to get your baseline performance out of the EMR? Oh my gosh, who said oh my gosh? <laughs> All right. How many days does it take to get like a thousand patients out of the EMR into a spreadsheet you can work with? A days, I was joking. How many months? <laughs> Give me a number, somebody. Who's tried to do this? Who's tried to extract data out of the EMR to do something meaningful? How many months did it take you? I'm, I'm a manager, so You're, I do it on a daily basis. You do it on a daily basis. I'm talking about normal people <laughs> at fr who, like normal people who don't have access, who have to put a ticket in. Three months, okay, great. So it takes three months to get data. You do something, you want to study it. It takes another three months to get data. So the whole thing takes about a year to do, minimum, okay? So you can, so, and what do you do? You take, you take uh, the doing things, you, you don't make it up, you don't divine it, you take it out of the literature, right? And then you use some data science to study it. So that's how we do it. Now, if you, the problem is with EMRs, and we, we've talked about this already in the context of physician burnout, I just want to give you a different lens. EMRs, how much money have we spent on EMRs in this country since the High Tech Act in 2009? 40 billion is the number. That's federal money, your taxpayers' money, does, does not include the $250 million that my hospital is going to spend putting in Epic next year. So that's not the private money. That's just federal money. Okay, so 40 billion. Now, $40 billion has been spent, and Epic and Cerner and the EMRs are essentially a black hole, right? We've heard that all the clinicians are tied to these computers. We have to input data, but we're not allowed to get anything out to understand our performance and our outcomes, right? There's no search engine, there's no... There no there's, exactly. So, in the, so given that, this is what we're left with. We have this blind physician that we don't know uh, when I make a change. Is it an improvement or is it just a change? And the only way to do this is to, if, if you want to get data out, so, so the, I'm old enough, I started practicing in 97, and when I did this in England, I had to do an audit project, I had to make a request, all the charts came, like paper charts, each one was that thick, they all got put in a room, I could only come to the hospital at midnight to do it after work, and I had to sit in the room, I had to open the charts, extract the data, put it onto a piece of paper, and then put it onto an Excel spreadsheet, and I can barely work Excel. That's how quality is done in healthcare in 97. So you think, right, 20 years later, is it any better? Uh, Jocelyn, I'm just going to pick on Jocelyn, she's one of the residents. How easy is it to do um, audit work or QI work now? Now we have this $40 billion system, isn't it just a click of a button? No, Jocelyn would have to actually open individual charts and then write down numbers on a piece of paper and put them into Excel. <laughs> I mean, right? That cannot be the way that we drive improvement in healthcare, right? So. Um, and if you don't do that, you have to go to an analyst and you have to do this like, six-month, nine-month circle just to get the data, okay? So uh, I was so fed up with this uh, four years ago, we thought, well, let's going to invent something so we can actually Google the data. How about we make that four-month process into uh, 60 seconds? Go from a question to an answer and then surface it with a visualization that I don't need to be a math PhD student to understand. I just want to know. I'm just a physician. When I change something, is it better? Is it worse? Is it made no difference? That's all I want to know. And that's like what most physicians want to know, OK? So if you can do that in two minutes and defriction that PDSA cycle, then we've got something else, right? And what is that something else? So let me just show you um, a quick demonstration. So uh, this is a, a hospital, uh, actually my hospital. And um, I'm going to, and they changed the protocol. So I'm going to talk about ear tube surgery. This is super dark, so it may not come out. So ear tube surgery for the non-physicians. You put the kid to sleep. Your surgeon puts a knife in the ear. They make a tiny little hole. Um, and then they put a little, um, a little plastic tube in the, in the ear. And they wake up, and the kids can hear, and they don't get ear infections. Great. But it hurts because there's someone put a knife in your ear. So this hospital, we, 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 changed, uh, we did an intervention. We gave them all three cents of Tylenol in the waiting room. So the question is, you gave three cents of Tylenol in the waiting room. Did it make a difference? 
Did it make it? So it took nine months to answer this question. Now we just have a series of filters. Show me some dates. Show me which facility you're interested in. Show me what procedure. So I'm here, I'm selecting myringotomy tubes. Show me the patient demographics by sex, ethnicity, age. Uh, this is all EMR data. Show me all the, the two to 12 year olds. The one year olds spat out the tunnel, so we d didn't include them. OK, so now in four filters, this is like Airbnb. If you, if you could book an Airbnb, you can work the system. And we go, great. So we've got a cohort. We found 541 houses, I mean patients. <laughs> Uh, what do you want to know about them? We wanted to know, hey, what's their pain scores? So we surfaced that this is real time, and, this, and the data comes out and goes, great, there's a control chart, right? So those who don't understand control charts, please indulge me, 60 seconds. Control charts come from industrial engineering. Uh, and uh, what you have, and there's no straight lines in biology, there's no straight lines in medicine, there's, all, there's always variation. So what you're looking at is pain across the y-axis, and there's month to month, there's variation. That's what we call common cause variation. What you want to know is, hey, when did something significantly change? And that's called special cause variation. And you can visualize that in a control chart. So that's what we did. So here you can see after the intervention, it drops. And, uh, and there's some AI in the background and it highlights in red and says, you have a signal. That's all I want to know as a clinician. I gave an intervention, did it work? Great, move on, rinse, repeat, right? It should be that easy. Um, so if you can do that, and it is that easy, what else can you do? Well, um, you can do something called adaptive clinical management now. So it's no longer a staccato PDSA cycle that takes a year to spin, right? You can do something and you can go, right, well, we're taking care of patients today. You, and then you, you have near real time. You should be able to monitor and evaluate. That's, this is what every other industry does, right? You should be able to evaluate yes, today's patients at 5 o'clock. How, how did today's list do or tomorrow morning? And then if it's great, you can carry on. If not, you can adapt. So here, this is this tight loop here. You, can, you should be doing this because we have the technology to do it. And every now and then you go, oh, we're going to change. In this example, we're going to add Tylenol into the mix. Well, great. When are we going to do that? We're going to start next week. Well, great. We'll start next week. And then we go through this bigger cycle. Oh, well, did it work? Right? And every now and then um, you might, you might st take a step back and you might strategize. We'll do it completely differently. So uh, what, this is what we're missing in medicine. We don't have, and we talked about feedback loops. We want this instant feedback loop. How am I doing? How's my team doing? How's our system doing? So, and I think the technology affords us to be able to do this now. So this is a busy graph, but I want to tell you how we eliminated uh, opioids. So tonsillectomies, for the non-physicians around here, you put a patient to sleep, you put a breathing tube in, you put something called a MacGyver gag, it kind of lifts your tongue out the way, you lift up your head, and, you're, and the surgeon can see into the back of your throat, okay? So you're kind of suspended on the table like this. They put a knife in the back of your throat, they cut the tonsil out with a knife, and then they burn it with the fire stick, <laughs> all right? So, um, I mean, the, the, the cautery bovie thing, right? I'm, I'm just the gas man, so that's what it looks like. <laughs> so, that's painful, it hurts. So forever and ever and ever, the traditional recipe for the last 30 years is to give morphine to these patients when they're asleep. The thought is if you give them morphine when they're asleep, when they wake up, they won't hurt. It, well, it turns out that this is, when they wake up, 22% of them need an additional dose of morphine. Okay, it's like salt and cooking. You just add a bit more. Everyone accepts that, and that's been the status quo for 60 years. You give them morphine, and a, f uh, and a fifth of them, a quarter of them, will need some more morphine. Great. Well, we went to the literature, and we actually found some, so, uh, said, look, um, nine years ago, someone published a study and said this other drug, dexmedetomidine, it's hard to say, but call it dex, is as good as morphine. It's a non-opiate. And so we tried it for 12 weeks. And he goes, wow, well, it goes up to 26%, but it's almost as good. It's really, really close. Nobody expected it because who believes the study? So why don't we believe studies? Uh, how much time have I got, by the way? <laughs> how, mu how much time have I got? Someone tell me. Well, I'm Yes, exactly. So, okay, five minutes. So let me tell. Okay, I'll, let me tell you a quick story. I'm from England, so I like soccer. Two World Cups ago. Paul the octopus. Who remembers Paul the octopus from? Tw yes, right. So Paul the octopus. You put the octopus in the tank. His name was Paul. You gave him two balls of food. One was labelled Germany. One was labelled Japan, or Germany versus Italy, or whoever Germany was playing. And Paul called eleven for twelve games correctly. All right. What's the p-value for getting uh, eleven out of twelve? Well, it's 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. That gets you to 0 0.00003. Okay. Just believe me. I'm Asian, I'm good at math, okay? <laughs> so, believe me. So, who believes that encephalopods can understand soccer and predict the future now? <laughs> None of you. That's because, 
You're right. Your prior belief is encephalopods can't predict the future or understand soccer. So I can give you a highly statistically significant study and you won't believe it. In the same way that Chris Glover published the study on dexmedetomidine nine years ago, randomized controlled trial, but nobody believed it because I believe morphine, you need it, okay? Now, the way you change behavior is you reflect <laughs> that back on you and say, will you try it? Let me show you results. So after 12 weeks, we changed. The next thing we changed was, well, let's get this 26% down, because that's the wrong way. We had a ketorolac. Ketorolac, for those of you who don't know, is a non-steroidal. <gasps> 30 years ago, I was trained that non-steroidals and, um, and tonsillectomy is bleeding, you'll die. Okay, so nobody does it. There's a meta-analysis that has 23 papers, that's 60 years work, that says it's safe. Nobody does it, right? The surgeons go, <gasps> you can't do that, they'll all die, right? So you go, right, please accept the data, and if you think they're gonna die from bleeding, let me track you your 30-day bounce back rate in real time, and if it spikes, we'll stop. That's the quid pro quo, what we're gonna do. That's a good quid pro quo, okay? So we're gonna do that. <laughs> so, and we did that, and now we've taken care of 1,200 patients who've not had any opiates for their tonsillectomies. That's amazing, and we published that, and the whole world's like, wow, how did you do that? Well, the data's out there. It's like an open book test. Open the book and do it, right? <laughs> but measure the result. So then we thought, well, if it works for a tonsil, why wouldn't it work for an eyeball surgery or a hernia or an ACL or all the other stuff we do? And, we, and so uh, this hospital did that, and this is over. This is now 12,000 patients. None of these patients in the right-hand cohort had any opiates whatsoever, and their results are better than what we've been traditionally doing. Their pain scores are lower, their morphine rescue rate is lower, their nausea and vomiting rate is almost zero. It turns out when they don't vomit, the parents like that apparently, and the, F and the family s uh, satisfaction scores went up. So <laughs> we've done 12, you know, so the last 6,000 patients, and this, this is gonna be coming, two minutes, okay, it's gonna be coming out in anesthesia analgesia, just got accepted yesterday. It's the largest case series of non-opioid surgery in pediatrics ever. And I just want to take this out to the world. There's no magic source here. There's no magic drug here. The drug's out there. What's the magic is being able to reflect your own results back on your staff so you can defriction that PDSA cycle and make it a continuous spiral. That's how every other modern business runs, and we should be doing it in healthcare. Oh. All right. Thank you.